What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike to the channel. Welcome, bike to the HQ. This is Big Dogs Got to Eat Fantasy Football coming at you five days a week. We're actually going six days a week now that it's later into the summer. I'm Nicholas. That is Noah at FB God on Twitter. As always, we're going to be doing a draft guy giveaway. All you got to do is follow us on Twitter at Nick underscore BDG at FB God. Who's creeping up? The clout's getting to your head. I see you. I see you fucking. Tweeting at Melvin Gordon over there, negative things. I just want a response, man. I bought his jersey last year. It's got the 28 on it. Now he's 25, and he might not even have a jersey this year. So I'm just – I'm about to cry over here. You're, reach, you're reaching right now. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah. don't get ahead of yourself. You're a Melvin Gordon <laughs> guy. He's on your team. Stop, stop throwing fucking jabs at him, all right? Hey, if he responds, that'll be, like, my biggest accomplishment this year. So I'll we take that. We got one from Animal. We're only getting one Melvin Gordon response for the <laughs> There's no way we get a second one. But today we're talking about a few other running backs in the NFL. And these are running back battles. Because throughout the preseason, a lot of things are going to be decided. You know, when we're watching preseason games, we don't care about stats. We care about the usage with the first team. And we're starting to see a little bit more and more. We're filming this on Friday. So we did not see the preseason games that happened Friday night or Saturday night. We've only seen the Thursday preseason games, uh, which were a couple of the battles that we'll discuss in a little bit. But the biggest takeaways are the usage that they get from the first team offense, because that tells you what the team thinks about them, what the coaching staff wants to see. If he wants to see the rookie running with the ones, that's a good sign to say that, hey, he's comfortable probably using that into the regular season as well. So we have a couple breakdowns here that I think will hopefully help decipher between two running backs that are in a heated battle in camp, or maybe their ADPs are within a round of each other. So you're only going to be able to select one of the two. Today, 2019 fantasy football running back battles hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy the video subscribe to the channel if you're new it's everything 2019 fantasy football we're gonna help you bring home the chip this year no are you ready uh born ready fuck yeah hit that intro All right, so the first backfield we're going to decipher is the Seattle Seahawks. Chris Carson, officially over the whole knee scope injury thing that he had going on in the beginning of the offseason, we learned from Dr. Morse it wasn't a, a major, major deal, but he seems to be over it, and the entire Seattle training camp staff, whatever, seems to be all in on Chris Carson. He's currently uh, running back 22, being drafted, and Penny has kind of moved back a bit due to the training camp buzz on Chris Carson. He's going around. Running back 30 in the low 30s, Chris Carson, you know, low to mid 20s. So there is a little bit of a gap between the two. Um, in the beginning of the offseason, I was kind of all in on grabbing Penny three to four rounds later. Obviously, with the buzz, you have to get a little bit higher on Carson because we know what Carson is as a talent, right? My concerns for Carson were not that like, oh, I just don't think he's that good of a talent. and Eventually, that will play itself out over the long run. I think that Penny is a very good talent. They use it running backs to a very high level. Um, if anything happens to Carson, my concern was, was injuries because that dates back all the way to high school days for him. Um, but the hype seems to be kind of overlooking the injuries. Where are you sitting at right now with the Seattle backfield? Honestly, I'm not going to grab both of them, but whichever one falls to me at a value, I'd be happy taking because you look at just how much this team runs the ball. I think last year they were over 530 attempts, but throughout Schottenheimer's career, like in the NFL, his offenses have averaged 470 rushing attempts. So with Mike Davis gone, that's enough for both these guys to get over 200 touches on the ground. I know it's not going to be split like 50-50, but we could realistically see Chris Carson get like 220 carries, Rashad Penny get like 150 to 175. And then the usage in the passing game that both of them are going to get just because like we've seen Rashad Penny in his rookie year be used in the passing game a little bit, despite Mike Davis still being there. And I know Chris Carson isn't like a great pass catcher, but like reports out of camp are that they want to get him 50 targets a game or 50 targets on the season. And I don't think that's quite like too unrealistic because like you look back at college and he had a terrible college target share, but everything needs to be taken into context, right? He was at Oklahoma state. He wasn't like a high pedigree player. He was sharing a backfield with justice Hill. They had two NFL caliber wide receivers. I know like Marcel Aitman isn't that good, but he made it to the league. Nope. <laughs> yeah. They were, they were throwing like 38 times a game at Oklahoma state when he was there. So for him to like challenge Penny's 10% college target share, he would need like roughly four targets a game, and not many running backs in college at all get that mark. And even last year, I think he caught over 20 balls. And that's not like – it's not great, but it's not bad considering you have a guy like Penny in the backfield and somebody like uh, Mike Davis who can both catch out of the backfield. So if he can flirt with that 50 target mark and catch like maybe 35 to 40 balls, I think he can live up to his ADP like very easily, especially with him getting the goal line work and the short yardage situation in this offense. 
Yeah, I mean, I, the way I look at it is I, I think Chris Carson's a much better runner. I think he deserves more of the workload there. I think both of them are good pass catching backs, and all of the um, things coming out of Seattle camp is that they want to get both of these running backs more involved in the passing game. I'm really interested to see the Seattle Seahawks play their preseason game on Sunday. So I want to see how they divvy up the snaps. Both of them got run with the ones last preseason game, but clearly Carson was um, – Actually, wait, I'm not actually sure if Carson – I don't think he played. I don't remember seeing anything from him. Yeah, he actually – they might have actually rested him. But Penny got a lot – most of the run with the ones. He did play, like, deep into the second quarter, I believe. Um, so that tells you that, you know, maybe he is pretty far behind Carson on the depth chart. I, he's still going to get a, a good amount of work on the ground, less than Carson. Uh, that's going to be the big, uh, the big factor is who gets the passing down work here. I think it's Penny. Last week, he took a screen for like 20 plus yards, looked really explosive. He came into Seattle camp, like very out of shape last year, playing at a high weight. And all the reports this summer were that he lost weight and looked slimmer. And, you know, you got to take those with a grain of salt. But he looked a lot more explosive in the first week of preseason um, on that screen game. And I think they're going to utilize both backs in the passing game. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, I don't want to buy into one of them. I'm going to buy one of them probably. Or I don't want to buy into both of them, I should say. Like I'm not stacking them, but I'm probably going to buy, in, buy into one of them. Um, and kind of see what happens. It will probably be Penny for me because uh, I'd rather just wait two rounds and not deal with like the injury concerns and deal with possibly being a running back by committee because obviously the lower you get in the rounds, the less risky it is. Uh, but I'm interested to see how um, they divvy up the, the snaps with the ones if Chris Carson plays on Sunday. Hopefully we see him in the preseason. If we don't see him at all in the preseason, I'm going to be a little bit worried there, to be honest, because I want to know how they utilize both players. Like We need to see in week three. Um, what the snap split between the with the two are. If Carson doesn't play at all in the preseason, he's probably going to move a little bit down in my rankings just because um, this could end up being a 50-50 share. And we, we're not going to know that if we don't see them play in the preseason. So yeah. right now, Penny seems like the value. I'll grab him two rounds later. If all this hype keeps coming out, his ADP is going to keep falling. And I'm, I'm okay with that because he has workhorse size, metrics, production in college to show that he could do it um, on a three-down level if yeah. necessary. And just touching on that, like how they're going to be using the passing game, there's only one game last year where Mike Davis is out and both of them played. And Chris Carson had three catches and Penny had four. So I think they're going to find a way to get both these guys utilized uh, on the or through the air out of the backfield. And who I'd rather have, I do like Chris Carson a lot, but you can't just overlook the fact that he's missed 14 games of a possible 32. And I yeah. think where Rashad Penny is being picked, he's going to return value if Chris, if Chris Carson plays the entire season. So Chris Carson uh, does go down, which has happened – a lot so far in his two-year career he's going to be yeah. a back-end RB1 and picking him in like the sixth round that's just a huge steal yeah I'm with you on that all right you want to move on to the Denver Broncos backfield with Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman yeah so this is a backfield very similar to Seattle in that we have two young running backs um, one with a higher draft pedigree but the one with the higher draft pedigree Royce Freeman and Rashad Penny have fallen behind their counterparts who were undrafted or seventh round picks. And Philip Lindsay obviously burst onto the scene last year, um, was the, I believe he was the first rookie running back who was undrafted to make the Pro Bowl or rush for a thousand yards, one of the two, um, was one of the few to gain her the other stat, whatever. Either way, he was very good. <laughs> yeah, fucking cut that shit out, honestly. <laughs> I edit that out. Um, so the way I see it, like, again, in the beginning of the offseason, I was like, I don't want Philip Lindsay where he's being picked in, like, the fourth round because there were a lot of question marks. The question marks were that he was coming off a serious wrist injury and he wasn't going to get runs with the one while there was a new coaching staff coming in and just the injury overall. We didn't know what the timetable was going to be. Um, his smaller size obviously leaves an area for concern um, in terms of, like, workload. And last year they used him as, like, the primary runner, the primary ball carrier. What I think we're going to see is I think Lindsay's actually going to be a very good value in drafts this year if he falls to like the mid-fifth, early sixth round, because I think they're going to switch roles. I think Royce Freeman is going to end up taking like 200 plus carries this year. Um, we saw him in week one of preseason. He, he mixed right in with the ones and he busted off a 50 yard run right away. Um, and that's, you know, one of the facets he brings to the game is that he is really big, right? He's like six or whatever uh, height he is, but he's like 225, 230 pounds. And he has very good straight line speed. So he can break those runs away. You have Rich Gangarello's offense coming in. He's someone that come over, comes over from the Kyle Shanahan descendants. And um, they're going to use this one-two punch. I think it's going to be Freeman more in a running role. But Philip Lindsay was, was a very big producer in the reception category last uh, in, in college. But you didn't see that translate into his rookie year, which was surprising given the amount of workload he got. But they didn't dump it off to him. I think we're going to see that switch role. I think Lindsay's probably going to take – 
maybe 10 to 12 carries a game, but also get like four to five targets. Um, so I like both guys. I would actually, because their ADPs are so spread out, like Lindsay's a fifth round pick and Royce Freeman is, you know, um, an eighth or ninth or sometimes even a 10th round pick at this point, I would be okay stacking both guys and seeing what happens. Cause Royce Freeman has three down workload upside. If something does happen to Lindsay. Yeah. For me personally, I think I'd only take one of these backs and it would be Philip Lindsay just because I'm not sure how good like Denver's offense is going to be. And I don't want to like push all my chips in the middle of the table for that. Um, and building off of your points that you made, not only Rich Scangarello there, he like he targeted running backs 27.7 and 21% of the time over the past two years, which was league average and well above it. But Joe Flacco is also there, and he's targeted running backs 24% and 27% in his last two healthy seasons. And with Philip Lindsay being like the obvious better pass catcher in this backfield, it's not like Royce Freeman can't catch, but with him being the better of the two, he's going to be out there on third downs. So he's going to be used out of the backfield. And I could realistically see him catching 45 to 50 balls this year and kind of being like, Alvin Kamara light, like not nearly as productive, but like unlimited touches being very efficient, which we saw last year on heavy touches. And even if that means he only gets 125 to 150 carries with those, like with that work in the passing game and them having like a really good offensive line and like getting all those yards before contact with that line. Um, I think he can return value as an RB too, just because he's got that big like home run playability as long as well as like pass catching chops and being used on the goal line last year. He had just as many goal line carries as Rice Freeman. So, um, I really like Philip Lindsay. I think he could finish like somewhere in the realm of where he did last year, just because he's going to have more pass catching work than he did in the year prior. Yeah, dude, this is like the quintessential copycat league. And I think we're going to see it come to fruition this year for a lot of running backs, how we're seeing you brought up Alvin Kamara. And I've made this point for a few running backs. I think Lindsay is one of them that can benefit from a lighter, more efficient workload and not taking those hits himself. Aaron Jones, if those guys are used correctly, not thrust into a 20 to 25 touch workload, they will be super efficient and they will return value on where they're being picked um, in fantasy drafts. And with Lindsay, it's like, you know, he finished top 12. So it's going to be very hard to repeat those numbers. But if you're able to draft them as like the running back 25, there's a good chance that he does return value. I, I don't think his ceiling is near where it was last year, but all in all, just like Chris Carson, he is a very good running back. Like it's not like the talent is going anywhere. We just have to make sure they use him in the right role. When he got hurt last year, one other thing to note is Royce Freeman stepped right into that three down workhorse role. Um, got like 20 plus touches in the week 17 game. So they obviously trust him to carry the load. If something does happen to Lindsay, if they do use him incorrectly and give him too many carries, he gets hurt. Royce Freeman is there. And the reason, you know, I would be okay investing in both guys is because Freeman's late round capital. Um, so it's not like Carson and Penny where you're going to have to use, you know, your fifth and sixth or fifth and seventh round picks on him. Um, these guys are in an offense that's going to use their running backs heavily. And one of them is going pretty late. So I'm cool grabbing both of these guys. Um, and I, I really like Philip Lindsay because he's kind of over all of the concerns that we had. It was like, does the coaching staff use him correctly? And we've already seen that he's back running with the ones They use him as the starter. The first like three or four touches went to him in the first preseason game. So we're not worried about there being a legit timeshare for the, for the starter role. And he's over his injury, obviously, because he's, you know, playing and in full capacity at training camp. So that is the Denver breakdown. Let's yeah, move on and to. I was just going to throw in like one more little big fact in games right, where Philip Lindsay saw between 10 and 15 touches, he averaged 6.42 yards per touch, which would have been sixth, and 88 yards from scrimmage. So even on like that limited workload, we saw just how efficient he could be. So even if he's the number two in Denver, he's going to get passing down work. He's going to be efficient on the ground. He's just he's going to return value whether like you think so or not, just because they have a good offensive line. He's efficient with the ball in his hands, and they're going to use him out of the backfield, which you can't say about many running backs who are in the timeshare. I do have I do have one concern, and I totally forgot about this because I think this was a stat that I found like very early on in the off season. I'm gonna pull it up really quickly. Is it yards before contact? No, it wasn't a a, a statistic for um, Philip Lindsay per se. It was the offense overall. Now I think we, everyone can pretty much objectively agree that this offense is not going to be that good, right? They're not going to be high power. They're not going to be explosive. However, they you know. With Scangarello, like, they seem to be an offense that can squeeze out production from the running back, regardless of how good or bad the offense is. I'm pretty sure last year, um, I couldn't find a stat quickly, but I'm pretty sure Denver ran, was like top seven or top five in terms of offensive plays run last year, um, which was very surprising, you know, given that they weren't that good. Like, usually you have to kind of dominate time of possession and dominate uh, plays to get that high of a volume. So it's like maybe they were good only because their offense ran so many plays last year. And if they take a step back and, you know, they're um, – shit, they're like mid – somewhere there's a fucking – whoop! <laughs> there's a fly right here. I got to murder his ass. 
Call PETA. <laughs> I'm going to cut this out. We can't let them get to us. <laughs> um, At least we're feeding big dogs, though, so they have, they have some uh, leeway. We're what? We're feeding big dogs. Big dogs got to eat. I'll see what you did there. Come on now. Don't ever say that again. <laughs> um, wow, dude. Fucking, that was incredible. I just threw that. I killed the fly with a napkin. And I threw it into my garbage can over there, which is pretty fucking far away. It's like right there behind the like air. 25 condition. yards. Dude, it was a fucking snipe. Sign. I could play fucking quarterback for Denver. It's fucking Probably crazy. could. Just um, I wouldn't hit that. No fucking way. I'm really proud of myself, honestly. I'm excited. Okay, back to what we were saying. I forget what we were saying, but something about Denver's offense possibly taking a step back. I don't know. I was just playing devil's advocate, um, but let's move on to the next fucking back group. Who we got? All right. We got the Los Angeles Chargers, and this is assuming Melvin Gordon sits, which looks very likely um, right now. So we have Austin Eckler, 34, RB34 off the board, 76th overall. And we have Justin Jackson, RB49, 124th off the ball. And me personally, I just – I don't get why people think Justin Jackson is going to take the starting job from Austin Eckler, if that even is like a still a belief out there. Everything we've seen when Melvin Gordon is out is that Austin Eckler is the starter in this backfield. He's gotten more goal line touches. He's gotten more third down looks. He's gotten more carries. He's out snapped him in the first week of the preseason. Everything points to Austin Eckler having that workhorse role with Justin Jackson kind of being a change of pace guy. Maybe Eckler's not going to see like 20 touches a game, but on 12 to 15 touches with his efficiency, I don't see a way where he like doesn't return value as the RB34. Just because if you look at last year when Melvin Gordon was playing with him on the field for the like the large majority of the season, he finished the year as the RB26 on a point per game basis. So even if Gordon does come back and you're taking Eckler where he's at right now, he's probably going to return value because he's one of the most efficient backs in the league and he's going to get his 10 to 12 touch workload with Gordon on the field. And if Gordon doesn't come back, the sky's the limit for the guy because Sure, he wasn't very efficient when Gordon was out last year. But if you watch the like week one of preseason, I think it's a good indication of how they're going to use Eckler this year. He's used a lot more out in space and out of the backfield as a receiver, where if you remember last year when Gordon went down, they kind of just threw him into that Melvin Gordon role, like the between the tackles running style. And that just doesn't fit like Eckler's, Eckler's ability. Whereas like they used him on the goal line in the preseason and on like pitch play. So I think they're going to, they have like a full off season to prepare and use Eckler as their workhorse, workhorse starting running back and throw Jackson into like what Eckler saw last year. And I think both guys are going to return value as long as Gordon sits. But with Justin Jackson, my issue is when Gordon comes back, I don't think he has any value at all. And where you're picking him, it's not like that's going to be like a bust because he's so late. But um, Eckler is going to return value no matter if Gordon plays or not, whereas Jackson is kind of like a dart throw when Gordon comes back. Yeah, I mean, that's the case. That's the takeaway is Jackson basically has no role once Gordon is back. And there's basically two outcomes. Well, there's three outcomes. They sign him before the season and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. He comes back after half the season to get uh, a year accrued towards free agency. So he comes back at week eight or week nine. And from that point forward, Jackson is unusable, if probably droppable, or they trade him, which I still feel like is very unlikely because you need to find a team, one that wants to give up pieces for Melvin Gordon and then also sign him to a contract. So – in my eyes, the most likely scenario is that he does sit out half the season, unfortunately, and then Jackson doesn't have value anymore. Like you said, Eckler's been a piece in this offense regardless of Melvin Gordon in the lineup, Melvin Gordon out of the lineup. Eckler, Eckler looked really fucking good in their first preseason game. He got the start. He got the first three, four touches. I tweeted out a little thread about Eckler. Like, we already knew that Eckler was a better running back than Justin Jackson. He's also bigger in terms of BMI and is probably more well-equipped to handle the workload. The one area of concern is, well, there, there's two pieces, I think, to this backfield that are so valuable. It's the pass catching work and it is the goal line work, right? Because that's how Melvin Gordon ate last year. I believe the entire running back group collectively had 135 targets, over 100 receptions, uh, over 1,000 yards receiving, and seven touchdowns just last year. And Austin Eckler, without a doubt, is going to be the pass catching guy in this offense if Melvin Gordon's off the field. That's not Justin Jackson's role. The goal line is also very valuable, though. Uh, and Eckler had as many goal line carries last year as Melvin Gordon did. It wasn't a high number. They each got four, but it was the same. They used him in the same capacity as Melvin Gordon. However, in the first preseason game, he coughed up a fumble right away on the goal line. The next series, the Chargers drove down. Justin Jackson got the next goal line carry and took it in for a touchdown. So I think a huge thing to, to watch over the next couple of weeks in, goal, uh, in, in L.A. is who gets those goal line carries with the first team. If it's Justin Jackson, he might take a big piece of that away and make Eckler less valuable. It doesn't make – I'm actually okay owning either of these guys. If Justin Jackson is going to go in the 12th, 13th round, I'll use him because he's going to be a flex play for the first half of the season. 
but Eckler is a much better talent. And the people that are making this narrative of Eckler being way worse on the, uh, way worse with Melvin Gordon off the field are the guys who started him in their lineup like week 15 or last year when they expected him to be a high end RB one while Melvin Gordon was out and it didn't work out. But Eckler had, he's had like three games, I believe in his career where Melvin Gordon is out one game. He was really good. And then the two games last year, not so good, but in a, in a very small sample size, efficiency is way less important to me than volume. And I believe he averaged 17 and a half to 18 touches in those games when Melvin Gordon was out. So give me volume in a very small sample size over efficiency any day of the week. And that's going to be Eckler. This is absolutely going to be a running back by committee. There's no doubt in my mind, Justin Jackson will get 10 to 12 touches, but if Eckler's getting 15, 16, 17, 18, and is much more efficient, much more explosive, more likely to have big plays, more likely to be involved in the passing game, and probably just as involved in the goal line. Like, give me Eckler there all day and tomorrow. I will say, though, I'm not taking Eckler in, like, the sixth round where I see him going in best ball drafts now. That's way too early for someone that you're not getting high-end production or at least doesn't have the upside since Melvin Gordon is likely to return after half the season. Like, you're not going to be able to really play Eckler that confidently in any running back slot after Melvin Gordon returns. So, are you, like, where are you comfortable taking Eckler earliest in drafts? I have him like really high in my rankings. He's like around Derrick Henry for me, just because I know I'm going to get value for those first like eight or however many weeks Melvin Gordon's sitting. I'm going to get like at least good value for half the season. And after that, he becomes a flex play where like a lot of those mid round running backs, as you brought up like last year, Alex Collins and Kenyon Drake and those type of guys, they busted. A guy like Eckler is at least going to return value for half the season. And for the rest of the season, he'll be a flex play for you because of his receiving upside. So I feel comfortable taking him in like the RB like 24 to 30 range. Yeah. I, for me, I, th- I think the earliest I would try to snag him at is, is likely the, like the seventh round. I just – that back half of the year, I'm just nervous that, yeah, he might be a flex play, but could be an inconsistent flex play. He could be game scripted out if they're, you know, if they're leading by two touchdowns, he's not really going to be used in the pass catching role that often. Um, so he does make me nervous second half of the year, but I think the first half of the year should, should be really, 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 really good for him who's someone that could put up borderline maybe RB1 production if if they use them efficiently um, and it could help you legitimately win weeks so sixth or seventh round is probably where I'm looking at them um, seventh round preferred what else we got in this backfield or other backfields we've got the Chicago Bears we have Tariq Cohen the RB29 off the board 60th overall and David Montgomery RB21 37th overall off the yeah, board Montgomery's fucking shooting up draft boards right now and I get the question, like, is, is, you know, is Montgomery like a third round pick now? And I already, I was already very high on Montgomery. Like my rankings when I made them like months ago had Montgomery as the RB 17 or 18, which is about a fourth round price. But like, this is, I know he looked very good, very elusive, and he made plays in the preseason, but Mike Davis got the start over him. I still think this is going to be a committee, at least for the beginning part portion of the year. Terry Cohen's still going to take pass catching work away. Although Montgomery is much better in the pass catching role than Jordan Howard was last year. Um, like I like David Montgomery a lot, but drafting a guy who you don't know is going to get a pass catching role, who you don't know is even the goal line guy. Like, do we know if Mike Davis is going to be in there on two yard runs? We're not really sure. There's a lot of question marks. I like the upside, but for guys going in, I think Montgomery is going to end up being a third round pick in two weeks from now, right? After the weeks two and weeks three game, I think Montgomery will keep showing well in the preseason because he's a good runner. Um, and I like the fit in the offense, but Third round is going to end up getting a little bit too juicy for me. Um, that being said, like, I'm not that high on Tariq Cohen either because, you know, my feelings on scat, like pass catching backs are just too inconsistent and it's hard to decide when to play them. So there's a, there's a very distinct possibility I might be out on the Chicago Bears backfield overall just based on their ADPs. Yeah, I kind of feel that way too. This is like really reminiscent of what happened last year in Denver where Royce Freeman was like absolutely like destroying defenses in the preseason and he became like a third round running back. The only difference is at that time, there was no other like known commodity in Denver's backfield. Here we have two other guys who we know like are NFL caliber running backs. Like Tariq Cohen isn't really like a running back, but he's more of like a gadget player. But I also want to say, sorry to interrupt, but like going back to Denver's backfield, they obviously signed Theo Riddick. He ended up uh, fracturing some shoulder. So he's going to be out six to eight weeks. But I think the signing should also say a little bit something about, you know, how they feel about using these, these running backs. And Low-key, like a very important piece of fantasy running backs output is which running back in the backfield is going to play in those two-minute drills because that ends up being like three to four catches a game. And if it was going to be Theo Riddick, that was bad news for Philip Lindsay. Obviously, he got hurt. He might not even make the roster now. Um, Devontae Booker is, is still there. I think they were likely going to cut Devontae Booker because they signed Theo Riddick, but we'll have to see what the case is going into the season. Um, but it is a little nerve-wracking. If they already had Devontae Booker, why not just keep him for depth and then use Philip Lindsay in that two-minute role? Does that take away from his uh, his backfield receptions? But back to your point, yeah, they didn't have anyone 
as a known commodity. Um, and now that we do, like we knew Mike Davis, Mike Davis was great in the pass catching role for Seattle last year. He also showed good on the ground. So he has a, a very similar skill set to David Montgomery. So it's possible that like Mike Davis just takes over for a series or two a game, which is going to lower uh, Montgomery's touch workload by three to five, maybe seven a game or something like that. Yeah. And I heard somebody, it might've been Mike Taglier on a podcast, bring up um, how when they drafted Dalvin Cook in Minnesota that same year, they had signed Latavius Murray to come over. And this is kind of like a similar situation. The only difference is I think Dalvin Cook coming out of college is like a better prospect than David Montgomery coming out of college. So I'm not sure Montgomery just completely like makes Mike Davis an afterthought in this offense. And because of that, like Mike Davis is still probably going to get like upwards of five, like five to eight touches a game. And that's not a lot, but that's just taking away from Montgomery's role because Tariq Cohen kind of has his like seven to 10 touches carved out in this offense as like a third down pass catching like gadget weapon. So I'm not sure he's going to have the volume necessary or even like the valuable touches on third downs or on the goal line to return value. I think if he's used how a lot of people want him to be used, sure, he'll live up to like a high end RB2 value, but they don't bring in a guy like Mike Davis and keep Tariq Cohen around to have David Montgomery be like a true workhorse in this offense. Yeah, they got a lot of good players there. So basically like the takeaway from this is we had Montgomery ranked highly prior to it, and that's when he was a very good value. And you can get him at the end of the fourth round, the early fifth round in best ball drafts. Now that it's catching up to where our rankings were, he's no longer a great value. You're going to have to pay a premium price for a guy that definitely has – I mean, he's got the upside for sure. He could take over a role where he sees 70%, 80% of the touches in the backfield. And if that's the case, if you want to gamble on that, go for it. I like to be a little bit more risk-averse in, in my earlier picks, and David Montgomery is going to end up being an earlier pick, thus making him more risky – given the red flags around him. So uh, monitor how, how much he swings in ADP. The only way I don't see him, like there's no way that he's not going to keep rising in ADP. He's going to get a few carries here and there. He'll make one fucking guy miss, and then there you go. He jumps up another couple spots, and that'll happen both weeks. Like unless he gets injured or um, it, it, the damage is already done, given last game's preseason out, out, like, outtakes from it, man. He's, he's going to keep moving up and it's not going to be good for his ADP. Yeah. And the thing about Montgomery is he's already as high as where he is right now, despite being third on the depth chart. And like the first snap he got in the game was on special teams. So if he starts getting like first, uh, first team snaps, his ADP is just going to keep climbing. He's going to be like almost a back end RB one by the time the third preseason week rolls around. His first snap was on special teams. Really? He like made a tackle on special teams, unless the announcer lied to me, but I heard him say, Oh, nice tackle by Montgomery. So I don't know. That could be another player. Maybe. I hope that was another player. That'd be fucking the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why, why would they use him on fucking kickoff special teams? I don't know. I'll look it up and I'll put a note on the screen if that's true or not. But I heard the name Montgomery and it might be him. So Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, check that out, please, because I'm actually curious now. But I think, you know, again, as always, like, you got to pay attention to usage. Weeks two, weeks three. Um, and a backfield we'll get to in a second. Like Philadelphia, we saw Jordan Howard get the start in week one last night. You know, speaking of Thursday night, Miles Sanders ended up getting the start. Either way, Carson Wentz was not the starting quarter. Let's just shift over to Philly's backfield real quick. Um, Cody Kessler got the start. He also got fucking absolutely destroyed and beheaded on, like, one of his first throws. So he came out. But if you're talking about the starters, which Philly didn't start a lot of players, I don't think they had a lot of their offensive linemen playing or a lot of their weapons playing. So it's hard to get a real takeaway of whether or not Miles Sanders would have gotten the start. But he was the first running back on the field. Jordan Howard got in on the next series. But that's what they did in the first week, too. Jordan Howard got the start with the first series, and then Miles Sanders came right on. Neither of them have been extra impressive or whatever. Neither of them have really taken over a clear number one role in the backfield. My thoughts, I'm sure you have the same thoughts, so we probably don't have to really go into it too deep. Uh, Jordan Howard's a fine runner, whatever. Uh, but Miles Sanders, everything out of camp is just like, he's been electric, by far the best running back on the field. And sooner rather than later, he's going to take over that number one role. What does it mean being under Peterson? And is it possibly going to turn into a committee? You know, we brought up this stat before. They've drafted three running backs in the era that they're in right now within the first three rounds. It was Brian Westbrook. It was Miles Sanders. And it was LaShawn McCoy. That is good company. And they use the other two guys as featured backs. So if they're as high on Miles Sanders as they are, and given the draft capital, it seems like they are, as the other two guys, he can definitely end up with a real legitimate, you know, 18 to 20 touch role. It's not going to be at the beginning of the season. So Sanders is a guy you're probably going to have to sit on. But he's someone later on in the draft, like the seventh or eighth round, where he's probably going to continue to go. Um, that's probably worth stashing. Yeah, and if you, even if like he doesn't have that role early on in the season and you own him, just keep him on your bench and wait it out because eventually the cream will rise to the top and he'll be that lead back in that offense behind what PFF ranks as the number one offensive line in the league. 
And if somebody in your league drafts him in like the sixth or seventh round and tries to reach, and he does underperform those first couple weeks, he'd be a massive trade target because this is going to be one of the best offenses in the league, led by a really good quarterback with a bunch of weapons that can move the ball down the field. And sure, he might not dominate goal line touches, but he's going to get a lot of catches in this field in this backfield. Um, he's running behind like an elite offensive line. Just there's so much working in his favor, and the talent that he has over Jordan Howard makes me extremely confident that by the end of the season, he's going to be their lead back. And like you said, could see like 15 to 18 to 20 touches a game. Yeah, that's going to produce. I mean, we look at last year, like they were shoving, um, what's his name? Josh Adams. Josh Adams had like a five or six game stretch where he was getting 18 to 20 carries. And Josh Adams is not a pass catcher in the way that Miles Sanders is or elusive. But it seemed like once they found a guy that they were comfortable with handing the load, like they were okay giving it to him. I mean, they've had Corey Clement, Wendell Smallwood. They haven't had a guy that they wanted to, you know, hand the ball off to at a significant, you know, rate throughout the game. So I, I think, you know, people saying it's going to be running back by committee are right for the beginning of the season. But if Miles Sanders balls out and he's getting 12 carries the first game, 12 carries the second game, 14 carries the third game, like that is a time to buy because before you know, he's going to get 18 to 20 touches a game. And he's one of the guys going later on in drafts that has upside that not a lot of running backs later on um, at that point in the draft really provide you. Yeah, and just touching on that, like, his performance this past Thursday, it would be like a week ago by the time you guys see this, he did have two big runs, but it was like the offensive line opened up massive holes, and that's not taking away from him. I think that just shows, like, how easy it's going to be for him on the ground because defenses won't be able to stack the box with the weapons that they have on the outside. And I think, like, if he just keeps busting off long runs like that because, like, he's a pass-catching threat out of the backfield, defenses can't key in on him, like, on the ground like they can with Jordan Howard, um, which is kind of like what they did in Chicago, why he faced so many eight-man fronts. Um, he's just going to have so many holes opened up for him in that offense that he's going to be able to bust off big plays. He's got that speed. Um, he's got the pass catching chops. Yeah, he's going to be the lead back sooner or later in this offense. Yep. Let's let's uh, let's run into some some quick backfield breakdowns right now. Dallas's situation is a little murky because Zeke is obviously in this little holdout situation. I have no fucking idea how that's going to play itself out. I would say I, I think Zeke's going to be back, but listen, I don't. I think he's their third priority in terms of re-signing. It's Dak, it's Amari Cooper, and then it's Zeke. And the fact that they haven't gotten around to signing either of those first two guys makes me a little nervous about um, Zeke playing in this season. So it looks like there's a very real possibility that someone else is a starting running back. And given their week one uh, preseason game, Dak was running out on the field. He was with the ones, so we got a real look at the starting lineup, and it was all Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard – Got the first three touches, four touches right out of the gate. Mike Weber eventually came in, but it was with Dak Prescott off the field. They have Alfred Morris, who they re-signed. They have Darius Jackson, who they have in the backfield. But it looks like Tony Pollard's backfield to uh, take over. And he got the runs with the one. He is a guy who would have produced in college, but he was sitting behind uh, Darrell Henderson. But he's got size. He's got athleticism, tons of versatility, a good pass catching back. He has the skill set to really do damage and, and be a top 15 running back if Zeke ends up sitting out for a significant portion of time. Yeah, and this is kind of similar to Austin Eckler, where if uh, if Zeke sits, he's going to have value. If Zeke comes back, he's going to have value because he's just like – he's a weapon in this backfield. I think he was a fourth-round pick despite not being like an elite college producer. And I know you said he's behind Daryl Henderson. He was also behind Anthony Miller in that offense, who was like a dominant producer during his time in Memphis. Yet uh, Tony Pollard still had over 100 career receptions. So, And we've seen videos out of camp, him running down the sideline and like burning Jalen Smith. I just think like Randall Cobb hasn't been like the – whatever like he hasn't been very healthy throughout his career if he goes down they can easily use Tony Pollard out of the slot as a receiving weapon and even if uh, Zeke comes back he's still gonna return value where you're getting him he's probably in like what like the 12th 13th round right now Tony Pollard yeah that's I, I was getting him um probably about a week ago in the 14th 15th now I'm seeing him picked in the 12th 13th as we keep going like now is the time to keep attacking him in the 13th ish round as we keep going into the off season with Zeke not having a contract, he's going to keep creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. Um, and again, like I will be the first one to say, I have no fucking idea what's going to happen with the Z contract situation, but you have to be, be prepared to go either way. Um, what are your thoughts on like, okay, so Zeke right now is out of my first round. Uh, I'm not picking him in the first round because the holdout things are very like Le'Veon Bell's paved the way and running backs are really going to be doing this and holding out and shit. Uh, where are you taking Zeke right now? He's moved into the second round for me and we'll continue to move down. He's probably like in the third round for me. I would take him ahead of a guy like Melvin Gordon just because I think when they're both on the field, he's going to be better than Melvin Gordon. But I'm starting to like take guys like to- uh, Todd Gurley ahead of him just because Todd Gurley is at least going to play a game this season. And when yeah. he's on the field, he's going to be productive. What do you think about like Zeke in the back half of the first round and then just reaching up into like ninth or tenth round and taking Tony Pollard? 
I like that because does, Zeke has two years left on his contract, and doesn't he have to play like eight games to accrue a year towards free agency? Yeah, I don't. I, I really don't understand like the, the, the <laughs> entire situation. Like he doesn't really have leverage um, right now, and like I, it's like he's unhappy with the contract and he wants more. And I understand it because he runs the ball more than anyone else in the league and has led the league in rushing yards over the last three years. But like, I don't know. I I, I don't get what this is going to accomplish for him. Yeah, I think if you go like Zeke at the back end of the first, because he's not going to fall to you at the end of the second or at the end of the third. Um, if you go Zeke at the end of the first and get a guy like Nick Chubb or uh, Dalvin Cook there, you at least have one elite running back. And then if and when Zeke comes back, you have like two top 10 running backs locked in. So I don't hate that strategy, especially when you know you're not going to get him in the following round. Yeah, I'm not mad at that either. I, so that's something I might actually think about doing if uh, if I have, like, back into the first round. The only thing I will say is if you're at, like, the 112, I would take him at the 201 instead just to say you got him in the second. Exactly. I feel a lot more fancy that way. <laughs> San Fran, Brita, Tevin Coleman, obviously they're going very, very far apart in terms of draft capital. I think we're in agree, agreement here that Matt Brita is – Matt Brita continues to be the single best running back value pick in fantasy football drafts. Uh, he is my highest home player as of like last week in best ball drafts. And I've done over 150 so far, which is actually fucking absurd. Um, but I, I snag him in the 10th or 11th round of every single best ball draft. I'd be surprised if Jarek McKinnon gets more than like 45 fucking overall touches this year. I have no idea when he's going to be back on the field. Rita's going to play the the one B to Tevin Coleman's one a, and in this offense that produces a lot of fantasy points from the running back position, passes the ball to the running backs at a high rate. Uh, Brita is just Brita is going to be a solid, a rock solid flex play that you can get in the tenth or eleventh round. I'm all in on Brita. And it's not like Coleman's ever been like a dominant goal linebacker or a dominant pass catcher. He's been like serviceable in those roles, and but so has Brita. And I know he's a smaller guy, but he's been in this offense before. And I guess Coleman's also been with uh, Shanahan before. But we've seen Brita produce and be extremely efficient last year. If he gets ten to twelve touches this year, a little bit less work than he got last year, that's easily going to return flex value because he was top ten in like yards per touch and like every efficiency metric and this team only got better. I know Jimmy Garoppolo like word out of like the camp in San Francisco is that he hasn't been good, but even if he like fails, they'll still put in Nick Mullins and it'll be the same situation as last year. And he was efficient with Nick Mullins at quarterback. So I just think in this offense and the role he's going to have, he's going off the board as RB 52. I would easily take him ahead of a guy like Justin Jackson because he's probably gonna have that Justin Jackson role in the beginning of the year, but he's also going to have it throughout the year. Whereas Justin Jackson's probably not going to have that role come week eight or week 10 or whatever. Yeah, and then when you look at when Coleman was playing with Shanahan, it was Devonta Freeman getting the goal line carries. Like, a lot of times people uh, equate goal line work with size. That's not the case. Usually the best goal line backs are the ones who can create yards and have good vision and have good balance. So they make one guy miss, and then they can find a very quick slit and get in there. It's not about just powering it up the middle. A lot of goal line carries don't happen from the one. They're from the two or three or four, and you need to make one or two guys miss from the start. Matt Breed is far more elusive than Tim and Coleman. And we've seen Devonta Freeman get the goal line work under Shanahan before. So Brita seems like a better fit to play a similar style to um, Devonta Freeman than Tevin Coleman is. So, yeah, we're, we're on Brita. Um, and really quickly, I'm not even going to let you fucking interject because I don't want to hear any Deion Lewis blasphemy. But Deion Lewis is also one of the best values in drafts right now because Derrick Henry, that calf strain has, you know, has gone on for three weeks now. The optimal time to return is between three and six weeks. So he could potentially miss some early season action um, and that could be something that lingers. That could be something that causes another injury because calf injuries or calf strains are very much like hamstring injuries where you, you might feel at hundred percent, but if you don't really give it enough rest, it, you're at a very high re-injury risk rating. So Derrick Henry scares me, which means Deion Lewis seems like the back to own there. He already had a very high pass catching floor, right? He caught 59 passes last year. We saw him continue to catch passes at the end of last year, even when Henry was getting 20 to 25 carries a game. So his role is secure. And this would only lead to him getting more groundwork. So I like, uh, I love Deion Lewis at the end of best ball drafts as well. Buccaneers, I see you have uh, a lot written up here in terms of research. <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell me your thoughts on this? All right, we got Rojo and Peyton Barber basically going in like the same round, just like four or five spots different. Give me Peyton Barber. What has Ronald Jones ever done to prove that he's going to be the workhorse in this backfield other than Bruce Arians say, oh, he looks good. The guy put on, the guy put on 30 pounds and his only good trait was his speed. Like, he's probably going to be just as fast as Peyton Barber this year, but Peyton Barber can actually make a man miss. So, Bro, did you watch the first preseason game? Uh, not the Buccaneers, no. Well, actually, I saw Peyton Barber. Yeah, I saw his highlights. Peyton Barber looked good. And had Ronald Jones – was he the one that broke off those runs? When Peyton Barber was making guys miss and, like, fucking falling backwards and getting extra yards. If it was Rojo in that role, like, people would be going nuts. This is exactly what happened last year. Preseason, week one started – 
Peyton Barber got 75% of the snaps with the first team. And we're like, oh, shit, it's Peyton Barber's role. On Thursday or whenever they played their first game, Peyton Barber got eight snaps with the first team. Rojo got four. We're seeing the same pattern again. I'm telling you, Peyton Barber, had he got more goal line opportunities last year and he scored, you know, eight or nine touchdowns instead of the four or five that he scored, we'd be looking at Peyton Barber at a, on a much higher pedestal. And he is a lot better than people are giving him credit for. So when fucking Peyton Barber balls out this year and returns flex value, if not RB2 value this year, you fucking heard it here from the HQ first. Peyton Barber season is in fucking full go. Yeah, the only person that Rojo is going to make miss this year is the person who drafts him in like the 10th round of fantasy drafts. Woo! Get him. I'm Get him. passing on him completely this year. Facts. Not around the same round. Now, I understand if you want the Rojo upside, which is completely hypothetical, and you're just literally making that up in your mind if you think that's a thing. But until he drops like two or three rounds later than Peyton Barber, I'm not drafting him. If we see that this preseason game, maybe they split the work or the snaps with the start is 50-50, I'll change my mind. But I think it's still going to be Peyton Barber getting 75% of the starter snaps with Rojo getting 25. And that's when you need to completely shy away from Rojo anywhere near Peyton Barber in drafts. It's Barber season. That's all we got for today, I believe. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button to enter the draft guide giveaway. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. Comment down below. Let us know that you followed us on Twitter probably already might be that will also enter you into the giveaway just make sure you let us know um subscribe to the channel if you're new if you're listening via podcast a rating and review would be fantastico until next tuesday we are out of here we love you Peace.